If you have your Bible and want to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, you probably don't need to turn in your Bible. You probably can quote it with me, depending on what version you're using. Why don't you just say it with me in whatever version you have? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Anybody have a version other than New International? Question for you to start out this morning, and I want to talk about faith. If you've got enough faith to know that you can pick up that microphone, I don't like these things. I don't know if you ever noticed that. If you've got enough faith to get you here, then you've got enough faith to get you there. Do you believe that? Kind of everybody's kind of going. So where is here? Well, here is where you are right now. If you have by faith received God's free gift of eternal life by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're really here, then you have been snatched from the kingdom of darkness and you have been placed securely in the kingdom of light. Now this means that you have been released from the clutches of Satan. You've been released also from his army of uh, evil angels, and you've been given eternal life. Amen. You have been adopted as a beloved son or daughter into God's intimate family. And here is amazing. So another question that comes up is, how did you get here? You got here by placing your trust and your faith in the Lord Jesus to save you, to make you alive So here you are. You are in the same forever family as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Esther and Jeremiah and John the Baptist and Paul the Apostle and all the other saints down through history. I could name all of mine. You know that I'm the 15th preacher in my family in the last five generations, but I don't know all their names. So let me ask you another question. How much faith did it take for you to get here? Who can say? All you know is that you had enough faith. You had enough faith to get here, and here you are, a son or daughter of the living God. Now, the next question is, where is there? There is where you're moving to as you live out your life every day. There is all the troubles and trials and opportunities and challenges and choices that God places before you on any given Sunday through Saturday. There can be a pretty challenging place. You can encounter mountains of problems, some challenging things. They can be pretty hard to bear. Your heart can be broken over there. You'll run into brick walls and you'll get run over by a few trains. You'll run into some situations that seem way beyond your strength or your wisdom. There can be a real scary place. And in our society today, there are a lot of people that will say to you, you can't succeed there because you need more faith. You encounter an obstacle, you find yourself facing a challenge, and you turn back thinking, I just don't have enough faith. Years ago, when we were in a church over in Redwood City, and I won't go any more than that, when our youngest daughter, Susan, was born, she was being carried so high up in Bobby that when she was born, her legs were crippled, and her feet, instead of going out, they were turned in. And she was in plaster cast when she was two weeks old. A well-meaning but stupid deacon, well, that's what he was. He came to me one Sunday, and he said, Roger... He said, as soon as you get your faith up, we're going to come over and cast the demons out of her legs. Well, I mulled on that for a little bit, and a couple of Sundays later, I said, "Uh, Bill, isn't that your daughter over there? Yeah. I said, she's wearing glasses. So? I said, Bill, when you get your faith up, we're going to come over and cast the demons out of her eyes. You get the rest of it. But you can grieve and mourn and feel sorry for yourself because you can't muster up more faith. So you start telling yourself that God can't really use you after all to do anything unless somehow, somewhere, someplace, you can get more faith. That is a lie from the pit of hell. We have been taught more faith, more faith, more faith. So often, if you go through this book from cover to cover, you can't show me one place where it says you need more faith. The Bible says 
You've either got it or you don't. God says to us, do you want to do great things for me? You don't need more faith. You can certainly get there. So don't lose heart. Don't give up, regardless of what happens in your life. If you can ask a holy God to come into your life to forgive you and change your eternal destination, you can change your life. Apart from any works on your own, we just quoted the verses. If you can do that, that is the greatest faith in all the world. And that point on, it's all downhill. The fact is, folks, you have all the faith you will ever need. What greater miracle could there be than receiving Jesus and passing from eternal death and damnation to eternal life? What circumstance or situation could you encounter that would require more faith than than that? What you need to do is make sure that you're utilizing and walking in the faith that you already have. Do you remember when uh, Peter, uh, I'm sorry, when uh, James and Peter and John came down off the mountain when they had been in the presence of the Lord, when they were able to see His glory. The nine, the nine remaining disciples had one in, run into a problem. The father of a demon-possessed boy brought the boy to them, and they couldn't heal him, remember? Jesus became angry. Turning to the nine disciples, He said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to Me. And later on, when the disciples came to Jesus and asked Him, Why were we not able to cast the demon out of them. Jesus said, because of your unbelief. What is unbelief to a believer? What is unbelief in your life as a Christian? It is when you become so weak and so passive in the faith you already have that you neglect or refuse to take the next step. You go backwards. You lose ground. Faith is like a muscle that never gets used. It begins to shrivel. It, be, it, it begins to shrink. And that is exactly what happened to the disciples. They had already experienced the power of Jesus. Remember, He told them to go out and preach the gospel and cast out demons and to heal people. They'd already done that back in Matthew chapter 10. They had faith then. They had already experienced healing the sick, sending demons running for their lives. But by Matthew chapter 17, they had let that faith grow weak. They didn't need more faith. They needed to return to what they already knew. It's the same for any of us today. If you had enough faith to get here, then you have all the faith you need to get there. And so whatever challenge may be facing you, wherever there may be for you, God's challenge to you is this. Don't become weak. Don't retreat. Don't falter. Don't turn back. If you had faith once, don't let it drain away. Keep it strong. Go forward. Take the next step. Do the next thing. I remember very well a young man that came to me following a revival service in Central California one night. And he came to me after the service and he said, Brother Roger, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, what's up? And he said, well, he said, I've been a Christian for X number of years, but... He said, tonight, while you were speaking, God very strongly urged me to go into the ministry. I said, that's wonderful. He said, what should I do now? I said, do the next thing. He said, the next thing? What is that? I said, is God telling you to teach Sunday school class? Then do that. Is God telling you to go next door and talk to your neighbor? Then do that. You don't just stop everything and go back to Bible college. You do the next thing. Ladies, when you married that man... Men, when you married that woman, did you have enough faith to, see, to say, I do? Did you have enough faith to believe that God would honor you and give you strength to be a good husband or a good wife through all the years until death do us part? If you had enough faith to do that, then you have enough faith to stay faithful. No matter what trials, no matter what temptations, no matter what you may face. See, you don't lose faith. You lose the will To walk in your faith. Jesus told his his disciples, he said, Assuredly, I tell you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you say to this mountain, move from here, and it will move. Wow, a mustard seed? Move a mountain? What are we talking about here? Mount Rainier? Mount Kilimanjaro? Probably not. You really don't 
see a lot of mountain moving in the Bible. The mountains in the Bible all stayed put where they were. Jesus is giving his men a picture. He was talking about anything that, that is huge and intimidating and unmovable in your life. Any problem, any situation, any difficult, any shortfall, any obstacle, any worry, Jesus says, don't let those mountains get in your way. Respond to the mustard seed faith that you already have. God already moved you out from under a, a mountain of guilt and damnation and condemnation. And he lifted you to heights of joy and salvation and healing and cleansing and a life that will outlast the stars and the planets. You don't need more faith, my friend. You need to hold on to the faith that you have. You need to take that faith, whatever it is, and plant it in the strength and the faithfulness of Almighty God. If He was strong enough to bring you here, He's got enough strength, strength to spare to get you there. Right, let's get a little further because that's pretty minor. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, 11, verse 31 and 32. Stand up and read it for us. I'm sorry, chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Thank you. So let's talk about something a little bit bigger. All of us have, at times, been faced with a situation that is so serious and so difficult that you did not know if you could handle it. Has God ever asked you to do something that you knew very well was far beyond your ability to deal with it on your own? Have you ever looked at something that God has brought to your attention and wondered how you, just one man or woman, could possibly do anything to influence or change it? If you have been wrestling with a change like, challenge like this, maybe you're dealing with it right now. I think that God may have you exactly where He wants you. He's got you in a place where nothing but your faith in Him will do. The time to be concerned in your Christian life when you come to that kind of a situation is not be concerned, not find yourself saying, I don't need to pray. I can handle this. That's the time to worry. Worry a whole lot. Jesus spent most of his early life, or his earthly life and ministry preparing his disciples to face the impossible. His first call had been to follow him. But that's just the beginning. Now they've traveled with him for three years, watching, learning, listening, and they would go on to do amazing things later on in their lives. It wasn't going to be easy. But Jesus said it's going to be possible for you once you had learned to live, breathe, speak, and walk in this thing called faith. There came a point in Jesus' ministry where his teaching methods te uh, changed. Instead of talking to them directly and to the point, he began to use parables to teach them. Stories. Jesus' way of giving the disciples eternal spiritual messages were based on everyday things that they could readily understand. Why do you suppose he did this? Why did he, uh, did he make it difficult for people to understand what he was really saying? The disciples wanted the answer to that. Jesus expect, uh, uh, explained it this way. He said, It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. 
In other words, this is what Jesus is telling them. Fellas, I have something of eternal value to say, but I'm only going to say it to those who are totally committed to following me and continuing on what I have begun here on earth. At the very time that Jesus explaining the reasons for talking to them in parables, some of his followers were packing it in, giving up. They were leaving him. You remember, even his his family thought he was a little bit crazy. In the in the midst of this, Jesus began giving the disciples teaching that would encourage them to have enough faith, faith to hold on and faith and hold fast to him, no matter what came their way. That's the encouragement he gives us today. The gospel gives us not only Jesus' reasons, but seven examples of these. I don't have a lot of time to do it. I'm going to touch on two of them this morning. The parable of the mustard seed and the parable of yeast or or leaven. The parable of the mustard seed we just read. It's an important lesson to learn what it means to have enough faith. Whenever you read one of Jesus' parables, you can know that there is more in there than meets the eye. Jesus is saying that God has something big that He wants you to teach. He wants to teach you here. God can take the small gift that you have, no matter how small it is, especially your faith, and He can make something great with it. What's your responsibility in this? Simply this, we need to plant what we have. We need to put it to to work. If he's given you an itty-bitty mustard seed of faith, we need to plant it where God tells us to plant it. We need to nurture it the way he tells us to nurture it. And then watch as it grows into something bigger and more powerful than we have ever hoped or dreamed for. You know, the most important movements in history, good and evil alike, didn't start with meetings. They didn't start with committees and subcommittees and study panels or symposiums. Most of them started with one person's small idea and a passionate belief in what that person was doing. For example, the Third Reich which was the embodiment of evil on this earth. It started when one man, Adolf Schickelgruber, that's his real name, by the way, Adolf Hitler, had a wicked vision of world domination and extermination of a group of people that he saw as an impediment to his world power. Now, there's been some great and very positive movements Because one man or just a few were filled with overwhelming odds. You can look at the evil ones, but one of the ones that I prefer and read over and over more than any other is a man by the name of William Wilberforce. I don't know if you've ever read of him, read of his life. You need to. Because he is an example of what can happen when a Christian plants a mustard seed. Because Wilberforce did what he did, he is remembered to this day as a giant of the faith. Wilberforce was a young British man with great political aspirations. He was elected to Parliament in the late 1700s, and he turned, about, turned out to be instrumental in the abol- abolishment of the slave trade in the British Empire. He wasn't the only one in England who wanted the slave trade stopped, but he was part of a very small minority. He had become a Christian several years earlier. He chose to root row for Parliament, and he won. And he became convinced that the cargoing of human, human beings for the purpose of slavery was terrible. It was most, most important, immoral, and humane, humane, unhumane. 
One of the men that Wilberforce met with at that time was a young man who had recently gave, given his life to Christ. A young man by the name of John Newton. And John and Wilberforce would meet often for prayer. In case you don't know who John Newton was, he is the author of one of the beloved hymns, Amazing Grace. And Wilberforce wrote in his later years, Let the consequences be what they are. I determined that I would never rest until I had effected its abolition. That's a noble idea. But it wasn't going to be easy. English slave traders had been capturing tens of thousands of black people every year and shipping them off to be sold into bondage. Most people believed that the British economy could not survive without the money that came from the slave trade. Wilberforce believed that if they abolished that, they could stop a lot of things and it would not harm the economy. And Wilberforce submitted draft after draft to outlaw the slave trade, and they would be shot down in Parliament. He was ruthlessly ridiculed. He was shunned by the British press and many of his own friends. But he believed too deeply in what he was trying to do. And he began to bring others into his program that shared his faith in God. In time, what he had started as a mustard seed of faith began to affect the slave trade. And it began to grow into a powerful movement. And the makeup of the British Parliament began to change and more men began to join him in this drive to stop the slave trade. Finally, in 1807, after nearly two decades of fighting, his own mustard seed grew into a powerful, full-grown tree. He and his anti-slave tr uh, trade partners began to, ad to ad adopt another draft to abolish this trade. And by this time, he wasn't met with jeers based upon other men members joining him. When the vote finally came, the motion to abolish the slave trade passed overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly. And it wasn't very long until this slave trade was a thing of the past. At the time they passed Wilberforce's measure, the entire parliament stood on their feet to pay tribute to him. But by this time he was so exhausted and so ill, he could only sit with tears streaming down his face and listen to other members of Parliament applaud him and the others who had played a part in seeing the slave trade abolished. God gave Wilberforce just a small mustard seed of faith. He caught a glimpse of the way things ought to be because he had the faith to plant that seed. It grew into something wonderful. I mentioned just two important movements one terribly negative and one very strong and good. Because I want you to understand this morning that wonderful earth-shaking things can come out of the smallest amount of faith that you may have. But I want you to also understand another parable of faith. The kind of seeds that you plant can make all the difference. There's a principle woven through the pages of the Bible one that the Apostle Paul directly wrote with simplicity, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man wrote, reaps what he sows in all of his life. We all know that the law of, law of nature teaches you that what you plant is what you're going to grow. If you're planting a field of corn, you're not going to grow green beans. If you plant a field of tomatoes, you're not going to grow raspberries. It's like the pr spiritual principle too. And that's why we have to be very careful what kind of faith seeds we sow. Jesus promised us that the kind of faith we sow, even a mustard seed faith, can become a powerful, earth-shattering thing. But we need to be aware 
And it also works in the negative too. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that only took a little bit of their faith to do great things for the kingdom of God. He said, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. That's what he told them. I don't think you have to have a great deal of faith. The very fact that you are sitting here this morning listening to these words, 2,000 years later, and maybe half a world away, tells you that everything he said to his disciples about mustard seed faith is true. Eleven of his original twelve disciples eventually took hold of what Jesus was saying and applied it. I think too many of us apply the things we learn in the negative. How many of us have learned, have looked at something we know God wants us to do and he has the power to make it happen? And we say, well, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work out between my wife and I. I don't think it's going to do me any good to pray for my dad. He's hard as a rock. I'm not going to help somebody and boldly proclaim Jesus Christ to them. People are cynical. It's not going to make any difference. I talk about morality and people are just laughing at me. All of those statements are planting negative seeds. And they're seeds that are sure to grow wherever you plant them. The question then, what kind of seeds are we planting today? Are we planting tiny mustard seeds of faith in what God has promised to bless? Or are we planting seeds of negativity and unbelief? Are you planting a seed of obedience? Or are you planting seeds that will just grow in disobedience and difficulty. It's a biblical truth that what you plant is going to grow. We Christians have reason to have all the hope in the world. But too many Christians in too many churches remind me of an old cartoon character, Bad Luck Schleprock. Remember him? Bad things happened to him all the time because he believed they would. If you want real life examples, you, have to, you don't have to look very far. Look in your own circle of friends. We've all known people who have a sickly attitude. They worry constantly about something going to happen. They hear about the, the, about the symptoms. And pretty soon they start, start saying they have the symptoms. I have a brother like this. What usually happens to people like that, they immediately begin to feel the symptoms. They actually do become sick. And all that fretting and worrying about getting sick becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Their bodies may be perfectly healthy, but in their minds, they're sickly and weak. This is the reason most of us don't like to be around people like that. People like that just suck all the air out of a room when they come into it. You need to stay away from people like that. It reminds me of a joke, and I'll close with this, about a little boy who was walking down the hall of his church with his father. And on the wall there were photographs of a lot of men. And the boy saw the photographs and he said, Daddy, who are all these people? And Dad said, Son... Those were all the people that died in the service. The boy looked at his father and said, Which one? The 9 o'clock or the 11 (laughs) o'clock? Well, where do you think the boy got that kind of an attitude? Probably from the frowning, unhappy faces he saw in the pews. Why are they frowning? Because they can't leave their problems in God's hands And just live as if they really believed what God's Word says. If we are going to live and walk and teach in the positive, we have to remember that we have Jesus. And He has told us that even a small amount of faith 
We can move mountains with them. All we have to do is take those positive seeds, plant them, stand back, watch them grow. It isn't always easy. And sometimes we make them more complicated than you might think. But I have good news to leave with, leave with you this morning. You have all the faith that you need right now. Amen. Let's pray. Worship our worship team to come, please. Let's pray. Father, we know you've given us faith. We know what we can do with it. And sometimes we're just afraid. Sometimes, Father, we just won't take you at your word and do what you ask us to do. We're afraid to tell our neighbor that Jesus loves him. We're afraid to stand up and, and, and witness for him in our job or in our playtime. Help us, Father, to do that. To remember what you've told us, to live the life that you've called us to live. And we give you faith in Jesus' name. Amen.